Howdy, howdy! Hi! And welcome to... But It Was Aliens! The paranormal comedy podcast where we pro paranormal activity to decide for the questionable benefit of humanity... Humanity! ...whether that activity really was paranormal. My name is Kev in the John, and alongside me, we have no idea what we will be covering today or why he didn't knock, is Mr. Granville Moonwalker. Today... We are heading from the UK to America and a few islands in between. I'm going to apologise now, just in case I am a twat throughout this entire episode. <laughs> so you are going to do this at the start of every episode I host. <laughs> I'm just going to add very quickly that I am drinking what is likely to be my last rum for a good month or so. Ooh. So I've got a can of Monster on the side. I'm embracing the energy drinks. Because I'm going to need them. Yeah, you are. On to drink cocaine. I, I'm mainly drinking this rum because you went off at me last time we covered this sort of topic. And I didn't. I, pro- I promise. <laughs> I will not <laughs> moan at you for not having a drink <laughs> the next time we record. I promise. <laughs> We will be travelling through this episode to the years 1716 and 1717, but before we get there, we must meet our cast. Our subject for this episode was born as the youngest of six children to Stephen and Elizabeth Bellamy on the 23rd of February 1689 in Hitsley, which is to the northeast of Dartmoor in Devon in the today United Kingdom. Mum Elizabeth passed away shortly after the birth, leaving the child to face the cruel, cruel world without a mama. The child, Samuel Bellamy, was tough and by his teens was sailing for the British Royal Navy. Samuel saw action in the War of Spanish Succession, which ran between 1701 and 1714. This man was not just tough, but was skilled at sea. It's rumoured that Samuel by this point already had a wife and child too, though no definitive evidence is available to prove this, and I'll just add that in 1715 the age of consent was 11, so this isn't hugely unusual. In 1715, at about 26 years of age, whether married or not, Samuel travelled to Cape Cod, with rumour suggesting that Samuel was in search of family, though that isn't verified. Cape Cod is a hook-shaped peninsula on the edge of Massachusetts in the USA. Samuel ended up at the Higgins Tavern in Eastham, which neighbours Wellfleet in Massachusetts. The Higgins Tavern was a fine establishment and not a place for young ladies, except for Mahitable, aka Mary Goody Hallett, who was indeed a young lady, perhaps even as young as 15, but who may have had experience from working in a different tavern, so was allowed to be there. Mehitable was a popular biblical name of the time, but has been misreported as Mary in modern times, and we are going to stick with Mary for familiarity's sake. Meanwhile, Goody was an alternative to Mrs, and meant good woman of the house. Samuel and Mary took an immediate shine to each other and soon became inseparable. The couple would take strolls by the sea talking of marriage, with the coastal location being an ideal place for a gentleman of the sea to support his wife and children through the multitude of fishing opportunities available nearby. Mary's parents, however, whilst not necessarily against Samuel as a person, did not approve of a marriage, for Samuel had no riches. Mary was to marry into a family that could definitively support her. Love was not a consideration. Mary's father saw the way Mary looked at Samuel and told Samuel to leave the town and to never return. Samuel made a promise to Mary before he left. Samuel promised Mary that he would return to Mary a wealthy man of whom her family would approve. When you mentioned that uh, Mary's father told him to leave and never return, 
my brain instantly went to Scar telling Simba, run away, Simba, run away and never return. Yeah, and Simba later came back to claim his kingdom. Told the hyenas, kill him, kill him. It's a great film. (laughs) This is not the time to reflect on the greatness (laughs) of the Lion King. He left the UK. Yeah. Is this where he goes over to... Does he leave and join the Navy at this point, or is he already... Oh, he's done the Navy. He's been in the British Navy. He's left the British Navy, gone to America, met this young lady, fallen head over heels, allegedly, and been told he can't marry and he's got to go. Okay, so... Because he ain't rich. He ain't rich. There this are, man's got nothing. He's a scoundrel, a scallywag. There are two things he could do here in my brain that are going to get him riches. Get rich or die trying? Yes. <laughs> Pretty much it. He can either marry into wealth by faking wealth and then come back or uh-huh. kill his wife, come back, get married. Or... Becomes a pirate. Yar. And this is where he could die trying. <laughs> <laughs> Pirates aren't generally successful. It wasn't just Mary that Samuel had met in Cape Cod. It's not entirely clear where, but it could have been at the very same tavern. Regardless, Samuel, a man experienced in staying afloat, got familiar with Palgraves Williams, an approximately 40-year-old man married with a child and who knew how to hold a package to deliver a load. One floater, one package. Samuel, together with Palgraves, headed on to the coast of Florida in early 1716 in search of the 1715 Treasure Fleet, which was actually two Spanish treasure fleets, the Tierra Firm Fleet and the Nueva Espana Fleet, returning from the Americas to Spain. Seven days after departing, Havana, or Nana, Cuba, on the 31st of July 1715 at 2 a.m., 11 ships in the fleets were lost to a hurricane, including about 1,500 sailors. A 12th French ship called Le Griffon was less familiar with the Florida coast and so sailed further out to sea, and because of that survived, making it back to Europe. Coins from these wrecks continue to wash up on shore today. Treasure can be tempting. Treasure? Many a sailor and other less gentlemanly scallywags were drawn to the Florida coast in search of this treasure. Much of the easily obtainable treasure had already been recovered by the time Samuel arrived, which meant that Samuel's get-rich-quick scheme had failed. How else could an experienced seaman get rich? Or die trying. So many men wish death upon him. Not yet, they don't. (laughs) He's just gone there to scavenge, basically, but all the easy stuff is gone. So many men will wish death upon him. I'm not saying that (laughs) either. (laughs) Not quite, anyway. You could say that all these people that have already come to the shore and got all the gold that was easy, Samuel was left with sand in his vagina. (laughs) You could say that, yes. You could. Okay, so um, I take it the easy gold is out of reach. So they, they weren't are... the first on the scene, or even the second on the scene. All the easy stuff is presumably gone. So they're like, everybody has come here, and everyone's got the gold that's easy to get. Mm-hmm. I'm an experienced seaman. I can swim. <laughs> I know how to... Uh... I was about to say pilot a vessel. (laughs) Pilot my vessel. Myself. He knows how to sail. Mm Mm-hmm. He and uh, what's the other guy's name? Palgraves. Um, They're going to rustle up some sea dogs. They're going to get, they're going to commandeer the ship. Mm. Go looking for some treasure. 
looking for treasure. After repeat failures in recovering any treasure alongside a small crew, Samuel and Palgraves traded in their canoes for a few periaguas, which are a very small canoe-esque boat sometimes used for fishing. Samuel turned to piracy. Pirate Sam! Yar! We're doing pirate! <laughs> it's probable that Samuel and Paul Graves, aka Paul Grave, aka Paul, did some low-scale pirating whilst gathering crew around the Caribbean. Soon, the crew were capturing a sloop when several ships approached. Samuel and crew abandoned their captured vessel and hid in nearby marshes, observing before making themselves known when they realised that these two were pirates. Charismatic Samuel was actually able to strike an accord with the stronger crews. Samuel and Paul Graves joined forces with the fleet of pirates that had approached, who it turned out were led by Henry Jennings, James Carnegie, and Leigh Ashworth. Jennings' right-hand man was one Charles Vane, a cruel pirate who I hope to get to in a future probe, if I can find a loose rumour of a paranormal connection for an excuse to cover him. <coughs> Cough. <laughs> the pirate supergroup captured a French vessel, and Jennings left Bellamy and Palgraves to loot the ship whilst Jennings and co chased down another French ship. Samuel and Palgraves sailed away in the ship before Henry Jennings could return. Pirates! It's said that Bellamy didn't like the unnecessary cruelty from Jennings and crew towards those captured. It just so happens that on the coast of Florida at this very time and in need of handy seamen was the bitter rival of Henry Jennings and the other leading pirate force of the time, one Benjamin Hornigold, Hornigold. along with his crew, including first mate Edward Teach. Do you remember who Edward Teach, aka Thatch, would turn into, dear probers? Ooh. He's... Is he going to align himself with... Uh... The next upstart, the future badass of piracy, he's going to do one of two things in my head. Mm -hmm. He's going to go join up with this crew and tell them of the whereabouts of the of, his en of their enemies and right. ambush them. Mm -hmm. Or he's going to change his name and run away with them. Change his name and run away. Yeah. Change the name and move on. Never get caught. That's it. Because the only way he's going to get caught is if these two cross paths and have a war. Mm-hmm. Do you remember who Edward Thatch became? Is it not Blackbeard? Blackbeard! Yar! <laughs> yes. <laughs> yar! It's the dynamite in the... Uh... Indeed. Indeed, who we covered in a two-parter, perhaps our last two-parter. Horny Gold. Horny Gold was impressed by Samuel. Being no fan of Henry Jennings, Benjamin Horny Gold took Samuel and Palgraves on as part of the crew. A brave. This period <laughs> was successful for Horny Gold and Samuel. Horny Gold must really hate Jennings, right? Yeah, like he could have just. <laughs> He knows that he's could double, have been a double cross. Him. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you can join me anyway. Samuel became one of the dozen key members of the pirate group, the Flying Gang, loosely responsible for developing the Pirates Republic and Pirates Code from Nassau, New Providence. Jennings was also a member, actually, weirdly. Hornigold and Jennings, even though they were rivals. Hmm. The two big figures. I suppose. If you're coming together as a collective for the good of piracy, all going to the same place all, to deal, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then you would just it could be, um, oh, what do they call it? Is it amnesty? 
mm -hmm. and you all arrive at one location, even if you're enemies, you don't fight yeah, yeah. there. So that location could be that, like, um, is it Tortuga? Tortuga was before Nassau. Yeah. But I mean, in Pirates of the Caribbean, oh, right. yeah. the way yeah. Tortuga Yeah, Tortuga is. Um, was a smaller, dirtier pre nassau in real life, but the Tortuga you so see like in Pirates the of the Caribbean was kind of based on Nassau in real life, full of taverns, places to Fun sort club. your wares, and Party. wenches. <laughs> Hornigold, despite being an absolute pirate, was loyal to England and even when times were tough, refused to attack British ships. Hornigold's crew gradually became more and more annoyed. Annoyed seamen out to sea means only one thing. Mutiny. Hornigold was, respectfully, voted off the ship and sent back to New Providence on a captured sloop alongside some of Hornigold's most loyal crew. Samuel had made a real impression on everyone and was voted to be the new captain of Hornigold's ship, the Marianne. This proved a wise decision. In only a year, Samuel, with Palgraves as his quartermaster, had captured no less than 53 ships. The fashion of the time was to wear a powdered wig, but Samuel instead chose to tie his long hair back with a band. This earned Samuel the nickname Black Sam Bellamy. Black Sam earned another nickname too, the Prince of Pirates. Renowned for his mercy and generosity towards those Black Sam captured and plundered. Sam's crew even referred to themselves as Robin Hood's men. There is not a single record of Sam ever harming a prisoner directly himself, and Sam is also recorded to have returned ships to those the ships were taken from after plundering them or when no longer in need of them. Sam was a democratic leader who always gave the crew an opportunity to vote on important decisions. Sam liked to operate with two main boats, a larger, powerful vessel and a smaller, quicker ship to enable coordinated, strategic attacks covering all eventualities. Black Sam was tall, loved fashion and often wore long black coats. Sam carried a sword and four dueling pistols on him at all times. It's been said that Sam only let non-married men join his crew, which explains why a 10-year-old joined Sam later. <laughs> but there are still accounts of some useful workmen being forced against their will to sign the pirate papers at the vote of the crew. Now, as a pirate... Yar. Does sound pretty cool. Like four pistols, sword, yeah. long black coat, hair tied back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd rather the dreads and the hat, personally. Right. But, pretty cool looking pirate. In From the sounds of things. Yeah, yeah. In general, pirates used to carry flintlock pistols, which are really inaccurate and really, really slow to load. So you basically get one shot off and then you're done. Turns into a club. He's like, boom. This boom. man has got four. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Dead-Eyed Duck and these fools. <laughs> pop, up, pop, pop. Oh, Dead-Eyed. I like how they people say he's kind and never harmed a prisoner on record. What about off record? This is the <laughs> 1700s. Barely anything was recorded. I reckon it was a case of do as I say and no harm will come to you. Mm -hmm. Force my hand. And I'll and... off you and destroy you from the annals of history no one will ever know about you yeah pretty much either that or he really didn't ever harm anyone because anyone he wanted to harm he put it to the vote of the crew and the crew are always going to vote to harm people yeah so he let them do it yeah he was like well i wanted to save you the crew <laughs> uh, i didn't want to do this i didn't want to cut your balls off mate that weren't my decision like you know what i mean you you heard him do it you crew. heard him shall we cut his balls off yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't even put that in their heads. It just happened. I, nah, nah, I don't want to do it. But if you guys want to, then, then we'll do it. Shall we stick a pike up his ass? 
Look, oh, I didn't even come up with it. They See? just they just voted for it, didn't weren't they? Weren't me, weren't me, it was them. <laughs> we rolled a dice. They chose it. <laughs> I gave them five options. <laughs> <laughs> they could have voted anything. They picked the five that I didn't give them. <laughs> Not my fault. On the 9th of November, 1716... <laughs> 1716, Black Sam captured a ship called Bonetta. Aboard the ship, Bonetta, b- b- Sam Bonetta. was approached <laughs> by an approximate 8 to 10 year old boy called John King, who was honourable and, according to the sworn statement of Bonetta captain, Abija Savage made on the 30th of November 1716, John insisted on not being a hostage, but on joining the crew. Honourable John even offered his own mother in exchange. What? Yeah, they captured the crew and this John was like, Look, don't, don't have a hostage. Let me join your crew. I'm ten in it, yeah. Let take my mum. Sam refused for a while, but eventually let John join the crew, officially becoming the youngest known pirate. In December 1716, near the Virgin Islands, Black Sam and Paul Graves captured two ships, the Pearl and the Sultana. Sam transferred to the Sultana, leaving Paul Graves in charge of the Marianne and letting the Pearl go free with all who refused to take up piracy with Black Sam. Oliver Levasseur, who had been with Sam since the Hornigold days, left the crew amicably along with ship Postilion around early 2017. I mention Oliver because Oliver had a scarred eye, proper pirate, and Oliver is alleged to have later left behind a cryptogram to a huge treasure in a necklace he was wearing at his death. Proper pirate. Um, I'll probe that one day. When did he leave the crew? In early 1717. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> this crew went on a really long time. Is this, uh... uh <laughs> <laughs> he time travelled. Proper pirate. Yeah. Bloody time travel. We. And he got Barbosa's curse. <laughs> For 300 years. Uh, <clears throat> Black we sailed these seas. Yeah. Unable to eat. Live to quench our thirsts, forever hungry. Randy. <laughs> Black Sam yeah. captured an awful lot of ships, and many captures were pretty routine for Sam. Sam and crew would either catch up with ships, ambush them, fool them into letting them aboard after using fake flags to get close, or people would simply give up in fear when they saw the crew one particular taking that is worth mentioning in more detail is when Black Sam took a ship possibly in April 1716. I've seen research referring to this ship as the Stee, the Bashida and the Mary and I can't verify which it was but the ship's name is not important. How it was taken is. Black Sam's men are reported to have rowed up to the ship but naked. Yep. The men stripped off fully before approaching. Sam's crew climbed aboard, drew their cutlass and pistols and went about like naked savages. The ship immediately surrendered. You can't fight mad. Sam took this learning forward, apparently storming future ships naked at times to strike fear into those attacked. Proper pirate. <laughs> I wonder whose idea that was. Oh, it's definitely Black Sam's. <laughs> Let's all get our wangs out. Yeah. <laughs> Shaking them about as they're storm with the ship. People are just panicking, can't believe what sort of... And thinking of the times, this is the 1700s. Who in their right minds would board a ship naked? Crazy. I suppose at that time you would think you were fighting crazies. Yeah, absolutely. You're fighting the most savage of savages. You don't want to get into that fight. You're you're giving up. Mm-hmm. It's a good good pirate tactic. <laughs> you just surrendered. You're on your knees and you get whipped in the face by a dick. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to do it. 
crew, crew, what should we do? Should we win with our dicks? I didn't even think about it, you know what I mean? Just a certain my dominance, like, you know. <laughs> that ten-year-old came up with that. We're <laughs> none doing me. Can't take him anywhere. In February 1717, Black Sam and crew spotted the slave ship Wider Galley. This ship was top of the range. Only two years old, with 18 guns and space for even more. The Wider Galley was more powerful than anything the British Navy had in the area at the time. Black Sam wouldn't make any mistakes here and would pursue through deception. The pirate crew raised the British flag on their patched up sloop and galley and signalled the wider galley. The wider galley captain, Lawrence Prince, looked through their viewing glass and proceeded with caution, observing a ragtag crew that didn't quite look like the navy should. The wider galley continued on and the pirate crew followed, matching the wider galley route. The wider got spooked and broke for it, going all out. With Black Sam's crew near, the wider made the call to fire upon the pirates. They missed. Black Sam didn't fire back for he didn't want to harm the ship. Perhaps this small delay in setting to fire enabled the pirates to get closer. Only when close enough to strike did Black Sam Bellamy's crew spring their surprise for definite and raise the black flag, the Jolly Roger. Yes, these folks used the famous skull and crossbones flag everybody is familiar with. The wider now knew it was Black Sam. The wider tried to run for it, well, sail for it, but could not escape. After a three day chase in total, Black Sam and crew completely boarded the wider, all 200 of the pirates. There was no battle, it was worthless, and the wider quickly surrendered. All aboard! Black Sam captured his biggest vessel yet, retaining the name as simply the wider. The Navy would have to run from Black Sam now, the richest and now most powerful pirate and fleet in the Americas. The wider was on its maiden voyage it turned out, so it was in perfect condition and was full of treasures too. Indigo, gold and silver amongst the riches. On top of the existing pirate loot, Black Sam's crew loaded onto the wider. Black Sam let Captain Prince and those of the crew who didn't sign on as pirates go giving them one of his other ships, for Sam had no need for this. Sam had his flagship now, upping the guns to 28 immediately. Despite all Sam's success, indeed, Sam was, by now, the most successful pirate that has ever lived, Sam longed for family. At the very height of his success, a mere two months after seizing the wider, Sam announced to the crew that it was time to go home, boys, and turned the ship north to head for Cape Cod. I was wondering, at what point was he going to deem himself rich enough or successful enough to go back mm-hmm. for Mary? So how many years? Just over a year. Fucking hell, he's done all this in just over a year? Yeah, God literally damn. most successful pirate ever. Ooh. The trailblazer. So now... It's like, go back, and he go back, goes back with his whole crew, mm-hmm. rocked up to the to house, tavern. and he's like, <laughs> knock, knock, Mary, and where's then, your frickin' dad? Yeah, if the dad doesn't approve, he's boys, like, boys, what should we do? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> nah, I'm not no. trying to put ideas in people's heads, but shall we all get our thumbs, all together, put them into one big point? And ram him straight up his jacksy. I'm not I, saying that's what we should do. I don't want to do it. I'm going to leave it up to them. <laughs> I didn't even come up with the idea. It was all them, weren't it? Is the dad now impressed uh, how successful and rich he has become in that short time frame? Mm-hmm. Or is he now worried for the safety of his daughter? Be careful what you wish for, daddy. Mm. You wanted her to marry rich. Yep. Now I'm rich and dangerous. <laughs> I'm the most powerful man in the Americas. 
Whilst Sam had been away, Mary had discovered that she was with child. This sparked outrage and Mary was called to the town hall where Mary was arrested and voted out of town. Mary had to leave her home in Wellfleet in shame and poverty. Mary moved to the ocean and watched the seas day by day for Sam's return, growing increasingly bitter. Adding to the sorrow, Mary had left her child in a barn for warmth whilst going out to get food and water and whatnot and one day returned to find that the child had choked on some hay and had passed away. Accounts are unclear as to whether this was just one of those sad things or whether Mary actually may have caused this event as she couldn't cope. This may too be why Mary was banished. The timings aren't exactly clear. Regardless, it's believed by locals that soon after... Mary begun practicing as a witch. In April 1717, the weather had been calm and Sam was within sight of home. Palsgrave decided at this point to visit family in Rhode Island and agreed to meet up with Sam later, parting ways. The wider continued on, capturing a few more ships on its travels including the Anne, which Sam took and appointed his quartermaster, Richard Nolan, as its captain. I guess this meant that Sam didn't have his best men directly with him? At this very same moment, it's said that Mary was approached by a figure, an entity, well dressed with a gold tipped walking cane. The entity had seen Mary once before, asking her to sign on a dotted line to grant her freedom from prison, offering revenge in exchange for Mary's soul. It was time for that revenge. The weather got foggy. One of the most violent hurricanes ever recorded on Cape Cod struck. Black Sam, aboard the wider, literally 500 yards from shore, was struck by this hurricane. On the 26th of April 1717, in 16 feet of water, almost all of the crew, including Sam, sunk to a shallow grave. There were two survivors from the wider, along with seven survivors from one of the sloops Sam had captured earlier that very same day, the Mary Ann. Six of the nine total survivors were captured shortly after making their way to shore and hung, with two who were allegedly forced into piracy freed after trial and one Native American sold into slavery. That enslaved person, John Julian, constantly tried to escape and even killed a bounty hunter sent after him during one escape before being captured and put to death. Two of the hung pirates were also called John, honourable and trustworthy. At the time of its sinking, the wider carried the biggest pirate loot in history, including £30,000 of sterling, loads of gold, ivory and indigo. Black Sam Bellamy is officially the richest pirate in history, having amassed a day fortune reported by some at $169.8 million, and some even estimating as high as a billion from pirating. In the early 2000s, it was reported to be $120 million. Damn inflation. Either way, this pirate was rich. Officially the richest ever. And now he's dead. Imagine seeing home in sight, and then all of a sudden you're hit by this yeah. uh, hurricane out of nowhere. I don't know if they could, because it was so foggy and hurricane whether they could actually see how close they were. But regardless, <laughs> in, in this sort of horrid storm weather, you're better off being in slightly deeper water so you don't thrash against the sandbanks and whatnot. Yeah, and and the rocks, that's basically what that. happened. The ship smashed against the sham banks capsized and then cannons all dropped through the floors and yeah it's a wreckage proper wreckage mary would have died not knowing that sam was actually coming back for her well <laughs> we'll get onto that in a second <laughs> revenge remember revenge 
I will just add that in another account of this tale, Mary Hallett was seen by locals running up and down the shore, distraught, having seen the wider on the horizon, encountering the storm, cursing at the storm. I'm not entirely clear on whether that is because she hadn't brought on the storm or whether she had cursed Sam to die, not realising that he was indeed returning. And not only that, but mere moments from that return to Mary, which would be very Devil Deal-like. There's another split in the account where some say that locals realised what happened and approached Mary with pitchforks and torches, driving Mary into a nearby swamp where Mary too drowned. Others say that Mary rode out to the wider and gathered all that she could, burying it on the shore, which we know could tether Sam to this area. Whilst what I've given you is the most popular telling, there is another account still whereby Mary Hallett was said to be an elderly woman when Sam met her. Another account still suggests that Mary was already married and Sam went to build a fortune to come back and take her away. Historical records suggest Mary was probably on the younger side, but we can't verify for absolute certain. It does appear in historical records there was a a meritable Mary Goody Hallett, who would have been around 15, 16 when Sam arrived. Oh, okay. Dirty devil deal. That is just the sort of thing you'd expect, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. I'm going to give you exactly what you want. Revenge, because he's never going to come back for you. <laughs> then and that revenge strikes the moment he's <laughs> in touching distance. I mean, pretty shitty for her to be ousted from the town for falling pregnant. Yeah. I guess it must have been one of those you can't get pregnant before marriage. Yeah, yeah, things. kind of, but that also wasn't uncommon. It's a strange time. Obviously, um maybe the parents disowned her then. And then yeah, got possible. rid of her. Or maybe she was lined up for someone else and that was the And then because she was pregnant they were like, Nope, fuck that. Or, Deals off. Or whether she was kinda shunned for being pregnant and whatnot but she wasn't banished and then the baby died and that's what led to her being arrested and whatnot i would say that we can't be entirely sure on the records because it's so long ago if she was in line to marry someone and then they found out she was pregnant that may have brought shame on the family name Mm -hmm. and we all know what or how serious people took family names back then yeah horror times Palgraves Williams survived and went on to accept the famous pirate's pardon. Pirate a bit longer, then retire a family man, passing away peacefully years later. Of those who survived the wider wreck, a Welsh carpenter named Thomas Davies, forced to remain with the crew at the crew's vote rather than Sam's own wishes, provided a lot of what we know. More came from the survivors of Sam's crew during their trials before they were hung. Thomas confirmed that Black Sam did indeed split all loot equally, giving everyone their share and bagging up the boat's loot with any pirate free to grab a bag at any time. Thomas was one of two survivors to have been tried and found not guilty of piracy. In 1984, American underwater explorer Barry Clifford discovered the wreckage of the wider under the waters of Cape Cod. Wreckage recovered included a name plaque for the ship and an engraved bell that also had the ship's name. This was the first authenticated pirate's shipwreck discovery in North America. 65 ship guns have so far been recovered, further upgraded from the 28 mentioned earlier. Bones were recovered too, and whilst initial bones were DNA tested against a believed relative of Black Sam and found not to be related, further bones were recovered in 2021, which will also be tested. A shoe and bone belonging to an estimated 8 to 11 year old boy were also found. The stories of a 10 year old pirate are true. Bones left behind, along with trauma. You know what that means, dear probers? Pirate ghosts. Pirate ghosts. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine being 10 years old aboard a pirate ship and actually a functioning member of the crew because pirates didn't just take people for fun. I reckon this 10-year-old was the craziest of all of them. 
Absolutely. He was like, "Yes, she will fire." Every time. He no, was, we can't start fires on the boat. He was the pirate. The pirates were scared of. <laughs> so like when um, they go out and they're like, next person that moves gets killed. He's a ten-year-old that goes around and just chops someone's toe off, <laughs> and then they scream. And it's like, right, you. <laughs> They slaughter everyone because of that kid. Yeah, no one can punch a child. Well, on land. <laughs> Is that why you're buying a boat? I'd love a boat so much. So, so very much. I always find it interesting when you talk about the pirate trials and most of them were found guilty. Two in this instance were found not guilty and believed to have been forced to be pirates, including the carpenter. Now, whilst a carpenter is some... It's a very useful profession, and you can imagine that being the case. Everyone's going to say they weren't a pirate at trial, aren't they? I, I was forced. I think you can also look. I didn't at, even like booty. Um, some of the ships that were plundered, mm-hmm. because he was said to let people go. Mm-hmm. The person whose name was on that record, their name might have been recorded on another ship as a carpenter. Mm. So he can say, I was kept and forced because of my carpentry skills. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, whilst Sam may give choices to an extent, he's putting everything out to the crew's vote ultimately. Absolutely. And if they need a carpenter. Exactly. (laughs) The ghosts of Black Sam Bellamy and Mary Goody Hallett are reported to haunt the dunes of Wellfleet to this very day. They aren't generally photographed, but stories persist. Before we finish up, I'm going to leave us with a quote that is believed to have come from Black Sam Bellamy, though it's sometimes attributed to pirate Charles Bellamy, who operated at the same time, lambasting the rich. The quote comes from Charles Johnson's General History of the Pirates. Black Sam had captured one Captain Beer's sloop and wanted to return it to Beer, but the crew voted to burn the ship. In Beer's words, Bellamy is said to have said, I am sorry they won't let you have your sloop again, for I scorn to do anyone a mischief, but it is not to my advantage. Damn the sloop! We must sing her, and she might be of use to you. Though you are a sneaking puppy, and so are all those who submit to be governed by laws which rich men have made for their own security. For the cowardly whelps have not the courage otherwise to defend what they get by knavery. But damn you all together. Damn them for a pack of crafty rascals and you who serve them for a parcel of hen-hearted numbskulls. They vilify us, the scoundrels do, when there is only this difference. They rob the poor under the cover of law, forsooth. And we plunder the rich under the protection of our own courage. Had you not better make them one of us than sneak after these villains for employment? That is the probe. Now, after that last little paragraph, Mm -hmm. would you be a pirate? Mm, Yeah. (laughs) I'd be a pirate before that paragraph. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) And I too would put everything to the vote of the crew. Unless they disagreed with me. Me too. I wouldn't want to be a pirate today, though. No. The pirates that are around today just don't seem as fun. They're not pirates. I'm the captain. Mm. They're kind of pirates in name, not pirates in nature. In their little tiny speedboats that they (laughs) rock up to a ship with their guns. It's not the same as going to battle in the old-fashioned wind-led ships with cutlasses. And living by... Cannons. By a creed. Mm-hmm. That's all right, what it once was. <laughs> Dirty infested place. <laughs> In summary, we've covered the true tale of Black Sam Bellamy, the most successful pirate who ever lived. Until he died. Black Sam joined the Navy at a young age before heading to Cape Cod, where Sam is alleged to have fallen for Mary Goody Hallett around Wellfleet and Eastham. Mary's parents told Sam to get, and so Sam formed a plan, 
funded by new friend Palgraves Williams, a 40-odd-year-old chap with a family who bankrolled Sam's plan to hunt for treasure. The two set off with a small crew to the Florida area. Kind of reminds me of Steed a little bit, ditching his wife and family. Yeah, just a little. Just a little. Sam wasn't very successful treasure hunting and quickly turned to piracy. It wasn't long before Sam encountered Henry Jennings, who left Sam with a boat to loot whilst chasing another. Sam double-crossed Jennings before meeting Benjamin Hornigold, a rival of Jennings who loved Sam's story and accepted Sam onto his crew. Sam and Palgraves became members of the Flying Gang, the core of the Pirates' Republic. Hornigold wouldn't attack British ships and was voted off captaincy. Meanwhile, Hornigold's number two, Blackbeard, went a separate way. Sam, now Black Sam Bellamy, was voted captain of the crew. Within a year and a half of piracy, Sam had taken more than 50 ships and in capturing the wider, a huge slave ship, before refitting it with extra guns, Black Sam became the richest pirate in history and most powerful at that time on that side of the world. With that, Sam declared that it was time to go home. Allegedly, home to Mary Hallett. On the way home, as fate would have it, the wider was caught in a huge storm. It's rumoured that Mary Hallett made a deal with the devil and became a witch, causing this storm in revenge for Sam deserting Mary with child, a child who sadly passed away. Sam drowned with his ship. There were two survivors from the wider alongside seven from another ship in the fleet. All but three were hung for piracy, but we have enhanced records of Sam's activity and generosity from the trial. Sam was basically the Robin Hood of the seas. Sam took from the rich and split the loot equally amongst his crew, the poor. With nobody able to recover the wreckage at the time, the story of the wider gradually slipped into legend until the wreckage of the wider was found in 1984. Mary Hallett has been proven in historical records to have probably existed and a potential Sam Bellamy has also been identified. Did Mary Hallett curse Sam Bellamy to drown? Did Mary tether Black Sam to suffer for eternity? That is the tale. Was the world's greatest pirate cursed by the Witch of Wellfleet? Okay. I'm ready to conclude. Are you saying that it was witches? Was the most successful pirate in history cursed by the witch of Wellfleet, Goody Hallett? No. <laughs> this is just an unfortunate coincidence. Because the only reason we know that Sam was on that ship mm -hmm. is because of who survived. We don't even know if Mary knows that Sam was on that ship. Um, yeah, to, to be brutally honest there, on that note, we don't actually know for definite that Mary and Sam ever knew each other. Yep. It's all just local legend and whatnot. So if this tale is true and they did know each other and he was going back to her, mm -hmm. she didn't know he was coming back nobody knew he was on the ship and drowned other than those that survived you cannot say that she caused it mm -hmm. so I think it was a case of it happened unfortunate weather occurrence they drowned survivors said who the captain was and then people pieced together this story and this story has Oh, traveled down over everything time. I've told you about Black Sam outside of the Mary stuff is all true. Oh, I know. I'm saying that people have put this story together of yeah, her they, cursing romanticized him. It, yeah, they? yeah. Rather than it just being just a pirate, not an accident, but the Weber just killing him. Mm -hmm. They they need to put something to it. It can't just be an accident. You've got to, like you said, romanticize it. And they also wanted to claim that she was a witch. So was she claimed a witch 
before the ship had gone down or after? I believe the stories are that she was said to have turned to witchcraft after being booted out of the town. So that would have been before Before, he returned. Yeah. So they've just added that to the story to... They've put two sad stories together. Almost justify their horrific behaviour. Yeah. And even going a step further from that, whilst, as I said, we've clarified that the ship recovered is the wider it's the only completely verified pirate ship that's been recovered thus far whilst we know Sam Bellamy was indeed a very successful pirate there's loads of treasure and whatnot has been recovered loads and loads of artifacts his story was uh, one of the main sources was that Charles Johnson book and we know that Charles Johnson was probably probably added extra details to make the stories better yeah so so yeah. All we really know for definite was Sam Bellamy was a hell of a Existed. pirate. <laughs> was the, so there's no doubt he was the most successful pirate ever. But further than that, he lived and he died, and he pirated a lot. And he had a ten year old on his crew. That speech <laughs> was probably written by Charles Johnson. Can you imagine being the most successful pirate in history, and your legend is overshadowed by? other pirates just because they were around longer yeah more notorious Mm. well that's probably a good thing in a way if you're less recognised I mean had he not have died he could have settled down with his riches and lived yeah true that's why they did it for though I don't think anyone wanted to be a pirate for the rest of their lives it was just a way to get get rich rich and get rich or die trying take opportunities otherwise not available to you but yeah obviously Pirates like Hoarder Gold and Jennings were the the one and two in pirate power for a long time, and then Blackbeard was the most notorious because he was a scary bastard. Charles Vane was just absolutely vicious. Sam Bellamy was only around for a year and a half and made more money than all of them. Good pirate? <laughs> <laughs> so as far as a pirate can uh, be good. Successful pirate? Yeah, but I'm, I'm concluding pretty much where you are. I mean, I'm not saying that it was witches. I obviously love pirates, and I have said many a time I don't believe in curses. I reckon Mary probably did curse Sam if that story is true. Any excuse to probe a pirate? But like I say, I don't believe that curses actually work regardless, so... <laughs> there we are. It's a pirate's life for me. <laughs> that is a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to But It Was Aliens. If you want to earn further thanks, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash But It Was Aliens and become a patron of the show for less than a cup of coffee or rum. Each month, we release bonus episodes we call Side Pros, and for that ridiculously low price, you will gain access to these Side Pros where we cover the craziest conspiracies, mysteries, paranormal passion projects, and royal peggings. If you have any suggestions for topics for us to cover in the future, you can get in touch with us on the X Twitter at But It Was Aliens. In fact, that is our universal and multi-dimensional social media handle, But It Was Aliens. On the Twitter. You could also say... I'm on edge now. (laughs) You could also say hello to us on Facebook, where Connected to But It Was Aliens is a secretly public private group called Extraterrestrial (laughs) Towers. Being a member of... Extraterrestrial Towers! Grants you protection from the aliens when they invade. It's been reported that Mr. Moonwalker has been seen wandering around the towers in a skin-tight green latex suit with a tube of lube and a peg. But there is no truth to that whatsoever. This man's ass was not made to wear what are effectively gimp suits and any alien visits are completely legitimate. And yes, you remain safe from them. That is it for this episode. So until next time, did a pirate found Argus? Sorry. Is piracy addictive? Like once a pirate loses their first hand, do they get hooked? Sorry. I'll get my coat. The truth is up there. Hash tag. By the time this releases, I will be a dad so I can officially tell dad jokes now. Gonna ruin every ending of an episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>